So welcome back to our new episode of the course on software design. We had a similar conversation yesterday and we agreed that we'd continue by discussing the subject of information efficiency. So that's what we will do today. My first question for you is, what is efficiency, how do we measure it, and where do we use it? In life. In life? But can you answer my question specifically? What is efficiency in general? Yeah. We have a volunteer. Something that is done in such a way that no other resources are used, so all, all the resources that are needed are used optimally. Mm -hmm. no used redundancy. optimally. Yeah. No redundancy. Okay. So in math terms, uh, it's ratio between uh, like your like uh, useful work divided by total work. By the total amount of work. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, useful work divided by the total amount of work. And it's a number, it's a number of numbers. So, this should be between... This should uh, be, in the ideal case, equal to 1, but in reality it's less than 1. Mm -hmm. yeah. Should I leave it, leave it like this, or should it be like that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, how do we measure the efficiency of an engine? Uh -huh. uh, with the energy that the engine consumes, say, or it converts to to, to useful work, which in our case is uh, okay. moving the yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have some useful work. Some of it is um, is wasted. And in the case of engines, it can be wasted as heat. You know, the heat dissipates and that's energy we're not consuming. What other kinds of waste can there be besides heat? Time. Time? Time. In an engine? <laughs> In a time traveling machine? If you waste time, that's really bad, yeah. You need to, in order to resist, to overcome friction, of course, mm -hmm. because we don't have ideally... Uh, Frictionless surfaces? Frictionless surfaces. Mm -hmm. can apply the same approach to information. If you want to calculate the information efficiency of an interface, you take um, the useful information, you divide it by the total information you've provided, and that's how you get the ratio you're interested in. In the best case, it will be 1. In the worst case, it will be 0. You can also multiply this by 100 so you get a, a percentage. Now, we'll try to put this into practice by solving an actual example so you can get an idea of how this 
works. I will use an example based on a discussion on a website which I will then share the link for with you because I think it's a nice explanation of the concept of information efficiency. Uh, let's imagine that we have a watch. We have to set the time. And to keep things simple, the watch uses a 12-hour format. And it has no AM or PM discrimination when it comes to hours. You know, I love the sound of the rain hitting the window. But I'm, I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> it, it might ruin our recording. So I'm going to have to stay on this other side. So you've imagined that you have a watch that, ha that has a 12-hour format for, for the display, and it has no AM or PM setting. Um, and we have to set the time on this given watch. So my question is, how much information do we have to theoretically transfer into this system to tell it what time it is right now. What are your guesses, Julian? Aha, gotcha. We don't have minutes or seconds in this question. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I forgot. I mentioned 12 hours and, of course, 60 minutes. And no seconds. No seconds. So there is no AM, PM or seconds. Oh, I just remembered when I wrote this, <laughs> I remembered an episode from my childhood. My parents and I were visiting some relatives and, you know, I was impatient. I wanted to go home as swiftly as possible. And they, <laughs> no, and they had a watch, an electronic digital watch somewhere on their furniture. And I kept asking, when do we go, when do we go? And they would say, well, five more minutes, ten more minutes. And I looked at the watch and I said, you know what? When this display shows 60, that's when we go home. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, okay. <laughs> and that's the hard way of learning <laughs> that uh, minutes are zero indexed. So I wrote 60, but of course, I meant between 0 and 59 inclusive. So how much information do we have to transfer to this watch in order to set the time in a theoretical scenario? Huh? Mm-hmm. So when you say depending on the current time, you mean that the watch can already be in some state? Yes. And you might have to change it just a little bit or a lot? Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's say the clock shows nothing at all. When you turn it on, it has no state until you specifically program it. Uh -huh. So you are now th expressing this in terms of the keystroke level modeling yes. approach. Uh -huh. In that case, we count operations and seconds for each operation. Um, but in this case, we have to measure information. Now, let me give you some hints. In how many states can a watch be? 
So the total number of states is 12 multiplied by 60. And how did you come up with this number? Mm -hmm. And how much is that? Well, it's 720. So there is a total number of 720 states. So this means that when you want to set a watch to one state, it has to be one of these 720. So there are 720 options to choose from. How many choices do I have to make in order to, to specifically indicate which of those 720 is the one I want? Well, think about it in terms of one out of 720. Not in terms of hours and then minutes specifically. Okay, let me try this from a different angle. I have only two states that I can choose from. How many decisions do I have to make to say I want this one or that one? Okay, so it's one decision and then I can choose it's either this side or that side of my decision. Now imagine that I have four states to choose from. How many decisions are necessary? One. So I make one decision. Is it the left side or the right side? Let's say I want the, the left one. And then I have to make another decision. Is it the one on top or the one at the bottom? So, and I say it's the one on top. So I made one, two decisions, and I needed to make those two decisions in order to choose one out of four states. We assume that we can take only binary decisions. Yeah. In this case, it's okay. Because you measure information in bits, uh -huh. okay. so that's why it's binary. Probably then in that case, it will be lower in base two of that number. So, and what's that? Maybe 9.5? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have a... In this digital age, everybody has a supercomputing machine in their pocket, but we cannot calculate this. If you have access to Google, maybe you can just type it in the search box. If, and if that doesn't work, you can always try Champ Hunt. 949? Don't be silly. So this is 9.49. I asked the question, how many bits do you need to represent a number this big? Seven. What would you say? Ten, Ten, Ten bits. Because you, you take this and you round it up to the, and you do it with such a notation, if I recall correctly. So if we look at what we have here, then we can say that whenever you want to set a watch, you have to transmit 9.49 bits of pure information because that's the actual uh, choice, which of the 720 states you want to choose for the watch to be in. 
This is the useful information. Now, depending on the design of the watch, you might have to press some buttons, set it into some mode, uh, press and hold, or just press. And when you take a sum of all of that, that's the total information you are sending. So our next step is to do the math. What's the total info? Uh, who owns a digital watch in this room? And you have it on your hand right now. OK, who owned one of those watches in the past? Um, so let's try to, to draw a model. You have a screen that shows something like 1242, for example, and you have some buttons on the left and on the right. What are those buttons? Okay, so let's say we have one design where you have one button for hours and another button for minutes. Just like Anna said. For hours and this is minutes. And anytime I press it, it changes the hour? Or is there some kind of a set button or mode button which I have to press first and then I can click those So let's say model A is a watch that has only two buttons, the hour button and the minute button. Anytime I press this button, it increments the hour by one, and it goes in circles indefinitely. And the same happens to the minutes. So that's one design. Now we have another another design of a watch, which has a different user interface. So design B has a set button, hours and minutes, and it works just like this one, but these buttons only work after you press set, and then you press these as many times as you want, and then you have to press set again to give it to take it out of the set mode. So you do it like this: you press set, then you press H and M a number of times, and then you press set again. In this case, you just press H and M as many times as you want until you are happy with the current state. Um, and let's have another design. Think about the past when you actually wore a watch. I remember one having two buttons. One So one button is called mode, and another one is called adjust. Uh, so it has two buttons. Uh, and the time is, of course, 12.42. So two buttons. And how do I set the time? Like you press once and uh, and you press adjust for hour, you press once and hold, and you press adjust for minutes. OK, so if I want to adjust the hour, I press mode plus adjust a number of times. Then I press mode again. And again, I press adjust a number of times. And then I press mode again to put it back into. Don't press mode or wait like five, 10 seconds. Uh -huh. So I press mode again. Or there will be a timeout. If I leave it in, in this state, 
it will eventually go back to the display state. Um, is there anything else? Do you remember having uh, watches that had even more buttons? So let me add another candidate here. that has uh, one button called plus plus, one button called minus minus, another one called set, and another one called mode. So uh, when I press mode, the hours blink, and I can press plus plus or minus minus to go up or down. Then I press mode again. It switches to the minutes. I do the same thing with plus, plus, minus, minus. And when I'm done, I press set. So imagine that I wrote down everything I just said. Now the next question is, how much information does each button press transmit? What does this depend on? It depends on the value of the string. Okay. On the, so it could depend on the value we are changing. Yeah. One candidate answer. Sergio, what do you think? Um, Vlad will help you. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Uh, Andrian just read something on the internet. Is it the answer? What a shame. So, Victor, you have to save the day. On the number of buttons. Yes. Why? Well, because if we, have, if we have more buttons, then we can separate each functionality to a button. For example, one button for lighting up, one to set more, one to. I mean, one to move, one to set. Well, we have two, we have to, uh, to be always in the mode and always in the set. And when you press a button, it actually, it's like pressing more than the button than the set. So it's like a three button. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, someone's attaching spam to the window. <laughs> Make sure it's on tape. Uh, I will highlight the buttons so we can see them better. So when I press a button, I am basically telling the system which of the end buttons you have, I just pressed. So if you only have two buttons, it's one bit. If you have more buttons, then each time I press one of those buttons, it's more bits. Because for example, if you have four buttons, you have to make two decisions every time you press each of those buttons. So the more buttons you have, the more bits you are actually transmitting, the more bits of information. The less buttons you have, the less amount of info you are transferring. So in this case, each button press costs us exactly one bit. So the cost one button is one bit for A. 
uh, for a system that has three buttons, how many bits are that? If you could do the same where there's a three instead of 720? Two bits? <laughs> uh, give me five more seconds. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll write this in blue. In this case, two buttons, same thing. So again, we pay one bit every time we press a button. And here, because we have four buttons, we pay two bits for every transfer. Now, the next step is to count the number of button presses that you have to go through to set it to the right time. Then you multiply the number of key presses by this number, and you get the total amount of information you are sending to the, to the system when you set the time. Um, is it clear what we are about to do next? Do you agree with the method? Maybe there is a bug. Well, let's give it a try then. Uh, we have to then take a few additional, uh, make a few additional remarks. So, if there are 12 hours to choose from, the watch can already be in one given hour. So, on average, you will only have to press this six times. So you press the H button six times, and the minutes, because you have 60 states to choose from, on average, you will have to go, you will have to press it 30 times. So you have six plus 30, that's 36. 36 multiplied by one, that's 36 bits That's the total amount of work, uh, that's the total amount of information that you are sending to this design when you set the time, on average. Now let's do the same here. Uh, you press set once. Then you press H on average six times. Then you press M on average. Oh, then you have to press, uh, and then on average, you press M 30 times. Then you press set to get out of this mode, so that's one. Um, so that's 36 plus two additional presses. So that's 38 multiplied by this. And that gives us some figure. Could you compute it and give me the number? Now let's do the same for this one. You press mode once, then you press adjust on average six times, then you press mode again, then you do this 30 times, then you press mode one more time. And that's 36 plus 3, that's... Oh. 
that's 39, so a total of 39 bits. Uh, it could also be 38 if we take this approach. If we don't press the final mode and we just use a timeout to revert to the default state, so that would be 38 bits. Uh, now, keep this in mind. You have the useful info, which we know is 9.49 bits. So 9.49 divided by 36, how much is that? 0.26. Okay, so let's multiply it by 100 to have percentages. So this thing is 26% efficient. Uh, let's try the same for this design. Fifty point eight. Ah, 15, so 15.8%. Uh, and this one? 24.33%. And in this case, it will be a little bit better. But what is it? 25%. So, based on the info we just collected, we can conclude that from the point of view of information efficiency, this is the best design because it uses a greater amount of all the info we actually give to the watch. Whereas this one wastes around 84.2 bits from all the amount we're actually transferring to it. Does it make sense? Yeah, we didn't do this yet. We'll do this one more time for that one too. So for now, we can already say a few things. The first one is that all of them are pretty bad. Imagine that you had an uh, engine that's 15.8% efficient. Uh, what's the energy efficiency of a regular internal combustion engine? Do you know? Or per perhaps you can look it up on one of your gizmos. Huh? Percent? You know this off the top of your head? It's more and the gasoline and diesel. No, the ideal motor is 100%. That's why it doesn't exist. Uh, well, could someone open a web browser and look it up? I don't have oh, Okay, I'm going to rely on my own source. So I'm going to do several things. Uh, you know uh, the Tesla electric car? Yes. So that one should be more efficient. So Tesla motor efficiency. We're looking for some average numbers just to, to have a, a rough comparison. Obviously, this depends on your speed, on the terrain, on the friction between the ground and the wheels, etc. Okay, so on some website, 
which is the Tesla side, they say uh, uh, overall drive efficiency of the Tesla is 88%, almost three times more efficient than an internal combustion powered vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on how you actually convert it, the friction between the gears, because this thing has to use the, how do you call this, part of the mechanism which transfers, so when the engine rotates, it uses some gears to, to transmit that rotation to the wheels. There is this pipe, Anyway, this is not a mechanical engineering university. It's not a shame not to know that, but it would still be better if we knew. But anyway, so on one hand, we have a car that's 88% efficient, and as they claim, it's three times more than a regular engine. So if you divide 88 by three, how much is that? <laughs> approximately 29 well you were right well when you said 40 percent you were not entirely wrong and you were closer to the truth than any of us in this room so let's write it down here 88 percent versus let's make it 35 um, Obviously, this means that a lot of our work is wasted when we press those buttons. There are several things we can do to increase efficiency. For example, in this case, by implementing a timeout feature, we saved 0.66%. Uh, it's better than nothing. Another thing we can conclude is that from all the models we've discussed so far, the best one had an efficiency of 26%, which probably means that there is room for more. We don't know what design is better. Information efficiency doesn't answer the question how to make it more efficient. It only answers the question how efficient is it. You can have several prototypes. You can compare them between each other. And then you can choose based on some, uh, you know, real data, not just by having a vote among your colleagues and choosing on, a, on, a, on the basis of a vote rather than technical merit of a given design. Um, so my next question for you is, in your opinion, what can we do to increase efficiency of a, to increase the information efficiency of a watch? Add more buttons. Use some sort of encoder. Ah. Uh, okay. I you mentioned an encoder, and this brings me to one other idea that I think is important to share. Uh, there are some languages, for example, in programming languages, some of them are more expressive, meaning that you write this, this much, and you express a lot of thoughts into this line of code. In other languages, you, if you want to say the same thing, you have to write this much code. So if it's a low-level language, it's not very expressive because you have to say more in order to get your idea across and make the computer do what you want. High level languages are more expressive because you can say the same thing in less text. The same thing might, well, it doesn't, it not just might, but it does apply to human languages. One observation uh, tells us that if you take one book that's this thick in English, and if you look at the same book translated into Japanese, it will be much thinner in Japanese. How come? They have more symbols in Japanese. 
yeah, they have more symbols, and each symbol is more expressive. You write just one little pictogram, but this thing is a bouquet of feelings and emotions and information. Of course, now this presses, uh, it imposes a greater burden on the decoder, the person who reads it. Now you need to know how to interpret that symbol. So is this what you meant when you said encoder? Yeah, sort of like you press one button, but it means like, like two pieces of information at the same time. Mm -hmm. I just thought about the course that we had with uh, computer architecture and you know, their decoders, encoders, and encoder when you have two inputs and it gives you <coughs> eight outputs or something like that. Mm -hmm. So if we try to apply this idea, let's say that instead of having uh, it might not work, but hmm. so how would you apply this idea of using an encoder to solve the watch problem? Writing the numbers? Yeah, I mean, including the numbers somehow. Ah, so. so plus, plus, every time, you somehow set the numbers. So if you had some kind of a numpad that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten buttons. But remember, the more buttons you have, the more bits you have to transmit when you press one of those buttons. Because you have to choose you have to make more decisions to figure out which of the nine buttons is the one you actually meant. So if you add more buttons, you are increasing the cost of each key press. Okay. Uh, we can introduce combinations of buttons. If I don't press just once, but maybe two times or three times. Like in Vim. <laughs> In binary. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, now uh, every button represented uh, like half of the, but uh, now we can, um, this watch can take information as a uh, combination of two buttons, just two presses. If I press one button two times, uh -huh. it will mean one thing. And if, and if you press it just button, once? Mm -hmm. How many times buttons pressed? Okay. Is there a way? <laughs> Yoo-hoo. Is there a way to go somewhere above 95 percent? Yeah. <laughs> Voice recognition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, telepathic interfaces are very convenient. Uh, but we can actually uh, reach, I think, 95% by making it um, sync every time you are near a Wi-Fi connection. Ah, so it would automatically synchronize yeah, sync with, know, maybe with something. Yeah, you need a special device that when you are around, it just mm -hmm. Actually, there are uh, alarm clocks that use some sort of a radio feature to update themselves. So this actually works, the method you described. In that case, the user doesn't have to press any button, it just happens. So from the point of view of information efficiency, that kind of a design would be better because it does the work without requesting any input from your side. 
transmission can do. Maybe I'm more aware of the first digital one where we press and the car can focus on our work, for example, and we took it to press, and then our will automatically into that, and then we release it, it will save the Stop at, the, so at that hour. So we can do for the hours and minutes as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or it, if or it will automatically start count when we press press tag, and to save the state, it can press once again. Indeed. So we can actually quantify that. So it's the same thing, but you press this. Uh, so I'm going to write it here. So I press H once. I watch the screen for it to increment. When I see the figure that I want, I press it one more time. Then I do the same for minutes. I press it once. I wait until it reaches the minute state I want. Then I press it one more time. So that's a total of four bits. Now, Wait a second. How is this possible? That's right. Now wait a second. This requires some thought. Huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. So the the problem could be. But wait a second. Maybe it will be the wait time until we uh, until we wait and also the road thing that we yep. we press it but it increments all the time. Okay. Hold on. Uh, before we try to figure out what happened here with over 100% efficiency, uh, let's take into account several other factors. And I'm thinking in, about this in the background. The first one is time. When we compute things in terms of information efficiency, we don't say which of them is the fastest. We just say which of them is more informationally efficient. It might not necessarily be the fastest one. So in the example Vlad just generated, you have less buttons to press, but you have more time to wait. In another example that you have previously suggested, um, when you keep the button pressed and you wait and you release it when you're done, there might be an error when you accidentally lift the finger before you reach the state you want it, or when you accidentally missed it and you know did it later, so you have to wait for another cycle again. So these two factors are not taken into account. This is a simplified model. Therefore, the conclusion is that even if you found something that gives you the best figure, it doesn't necessarily imply that that's the thing you actually have to do in production. You can use this as one of the uh, decision-making factors in your scheme, but you shouldn't rely on this exclusively. Now let's see what happens here. If that's a total of four presses, we only have two possible states, two buttons. You know, it's, it's one of those cases where there's some subtle error which you didn't notice. How much time do we have? <laughs> 21 minutes? So we have 21 minutes to figure this one out. 
or to acknowledge that we haven't found a solution yet. Okay, I see your point, but in this case, we are not taking errors into account. We just count the number of uh, times you press the button, and that's it. So my guess is that the waiting time so far, we computed costs just in terms of pressing keys. So indeed, if it's only about pressing keys, then it's four bits. But it's also about when you press the key. The amount of time you are waiting is also transmitting some information. Because you can wait longer, and you have a bigger number, you can wait less, and you have a smaller number. But I'm not sure how we can apply this method to quantify the waiting time. So I have to think about it and do some research. It's an interesting question, but I have uh, no definitive answer right now. Yeah. Or we could add uh, a magic constant, and we could call it dark energy, <laughs> such that the whole thing cancels. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's move on. Uh, yeah, this could be an exam question. <laughs> I'll just outsource it to you guys. Um, let's think about implications of what we've just discussed. Um, when, so one thing we noticed is that the more buttons you have, the more information you have to transmit when you press one of those buttons. So imagine that we designed some piece of software for a point of sales terminal in a store. Or you know, when you do your groceries, you bring the bags, you give them to a person who scans them, and sometimes they have to type some numbers on a, on a screen. You're familiar with this, right? Uh, usually, when you look at that system, It's, it could be a Windows-powered computer. For example, if you go to Lineala, they are running Windows, Windows 7. Um, this machine has a keyboard attached to it. It's one of those 104-button uh, keyboards. IBM PC compatible ones. So every time the clerk who manages this transaction presses a key, they are transmitting a certain amount of information. Because if you have 104 keys, if you want to choose which one of those keys you are pressing, 
you have to make this many decisions. So basically that's how many bits you are sending every time a button is pressed on this keyboard. So my question is, how can we improve that? In your opinion. So in this case, when you have a lot of buttons, the information efficiency is low because each button press is worth a lot of bits. How can we make this system more informationally efficient? Yeah. So on one hand, we can sacrifice the numpad, and we only have one hundred. Uh, we only have ninety something buttons. We can arrange buttons uh, by their frequency, how frequently they are pressed. Mm -hmm. and this should uh, decrease the uh, information weight, information cost. Mm -hmm. You can also combine this with uh, Fitts law, which you hopefully remember from the previous classes. When something is bigger, it's easier to hit. So you take the most commonly used buttons, you make them really big, and you place them not under three layers of menus, but just right there at the top of the screen. That's indeed a thing you can do. What else? Nico. You know, I think uh, people who, if anyone actually watches these videos, at some point they will realize that if I name someone, it's a person who was not paying attention. <laughs> Especially now that I've uh, given up the secret. Yeah. So, what else can we do? Try to think about uh, different stores you visited in your lifetime. Were all of them using a 104 button keyboard no. to get their things done? What, were diff what was different in other stores? store in RAM. So let me try to rephrase my question. If they were not using a 104 button keyboard, what were they using? Huh? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So there is some scanner attached to the computer which automatically computes all the costs. You just have to scan the barcode on the product. It automatically passes on the scanner. And if the scanner doesn't work, the barcode isn't readable, they usually have to punch in the number by hand. So they definitely need a numpad. But not the rest of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Google voice input. You say, OK, Google, how much is this worth? You ask <laughs> yeah, I, uh, a few days ago I began experimenting with uh, this thing and I enabled it on my phone and I say, dial mom and the voice says, which mom? 
that was a surprise. <laughs> she has multiple SIM cards and numbers, so that's what the machine wanted to know. Um, but, okay, so let's say you scan an item, the barcode isn't readable, you have to type it in manually using the numpad. And if you made a mistake, what do you do? So you have to have some additional button besides the numpad, which allows you to correct some input errors. You could have a button, a backspace, which deletes the last enter digit. So you cannot use just a numpad as is. Well, the backspace button is on the numpad, right? No, no, no. But it has a delete button, right? Yeah. But don't, if you press numlock, then something on the numpad acts as a backspace. Okay, so there is a, a delete button on the numpad if you press shift or something. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you cannot use a numpad as is if you want to have a backspace button. You, what do you do? <laughs> you rip off the part of the keyboard that has the backspace button on it? <laughs> oh, you use a USB backspace button. <laughs> okay, so if you, I actually encourage you to pay attention to these things because this is really interesting. What they normally do, or what they sometimes do, is they have a dedicated device, custom designed piece of hardware that has exactly the buttons they need. As a result, so let's say you have your custom device, which has some uh, magic buttons. If you look at the keyboard interfaces in uh, Unimarket, which is another chain of stores in the city, you will notice that they have a special keyboard with a numpad and some dedicated buttons on top. Well, maybe it's not in, in Luni Market, but Petrochka. But anyway, in other stores in this city, they have some uh, custom-built hardware where buttons, certain buttons have different colors and different functions. So this is an example of a hardware device designed specifically for this type of problem. The advantage of that is that you can make it do whatever you want it to do. For example, let's say uh, sometimes when somebody buys a product, they have five units of the same thing. So you can either scan it five times, or you can scan it once, and you can have several hardware buttons. One of them says X2, X3, X4, and X, X5. Or X and a numpad. Huh? Or X and a numpad. And X and a numpad. So you need to have a number, a, a special button called multiply. And then you can rely on those other buttons. But if you observe your customers and somehow your statistics reveals that the most common scenario is that people usually buy two pairs of something. For example, if in the store you have offers, buy, buy two, get one free, or something like that. Then you can have a dedicated X2 button, so you can press this right away instead of pressing multiply two, which is two button presses instead of one. Um, but again, I'm not saying you have to have a, an X2 button, but the point is that sometimes if you analyze 
the workflow of your customers in the store, you might conclude that I need a special button for this purpose and another special button for that purpose. If you build custom physical input devices for that, it's going to be really pricey. What's the alternative? Rewrite the drivers, but you still use this big keyboard. Ah, like uh, insert plus minus. Uh -huh. So you can just add a, another sticker on top of the button and rewrite the driver such that this thing now does something else. Okay. Has anyone ever written a driver? It's more complicated than writing a user mode application. Though in the, for example, on Windows recently, as of Vista, they, they made a thing called UMDF, User Mode Driver Framework. Normally a driver operates in kernel mode, and in that case if you make a mistake then you have a blue screen which is why developing drivers and debugging them is more complex than user mode software. So besides rewriting drivers, what else can we have? You don't go to the stores? You don't buy stuff? <laughs> you buy it online. Okay. Anna, what do you think? And Anna was paying attention. I just called her name. It was a statement for our, yours. Yeah. You can have a touch screen with a full screen program with buttons of whatever shape you want, any color you prefer, and you can hide anything you don't want to be on the screen. So that gives you great flexibility because you don't have to pay a lot for custom hardware. You don't have to write low level software to rewrite drivers and handle key presses differently. So that's one alternative. Um, what are your questions? Besides what do we do with those four bits with over 100 questions? <laughs> what will be on the internet? The midterm exam? I need to think about it. It's not going to be anything different from what we've discussed in class. We'll have it on Tuesday. Uh, this Tuesday? No. The next one. Next at what time? I think at this time. Oh, do you know? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, let me know beforehand. There is no schedule yet. There is no schedule yet. Um, I, I told you that I would mention the source of this watch example. Uh, you can find it here. Just go to the side, do some searching, and you could look for information efficiency. And you'll find a detailed example where the author analyzes a completely different approach, which has more buttons and a different interface. So you could, you know, look it up if you're really interested in this subject. Huh? Yeah. A button and the wheel. Uh, the wheel is a continuous thing. It's not a discrete. Uh, 
uh, you can have it like on an iPod, where you, you move it, and it moves discreetly on elements on the screen. Or like in the last generation, I watch, there is a button with a wheel. A button with a wheel. Mm -hmm. So let me try to answer that. If you go to the source, and you read the analysis of uh, what's the information efficiency of a digital watch, somewhere at the end of the article, there is uh, another section which does the same thing for an, an analog watch. One that looks like this. Uh, so you have the watch. And it has a little widget here. How does that work? You pull it out, you rotate your hand, and then you pull it back in. The way Aza Raskin computed it, that's the person who runs the site, and also the son of the guy who wrote this. So the way he computes it is as follows. Uh, when you pull it out, you send one bit. When you rotate it, you send exactly the amount of information we've computed here. So that's 9.49. And then when you push it back, you give it one more bit, and that's a total of 11.49. And you divide that by 9.49? Oh, it's the other way around. And what does, what does this compute to? So 82.7. Yeah. which is way better than anything we've considered so far, except the one that uses some wireless technology to automatically synchronize. And then there is another thing you can do to make it even better than that, which is to rely on a quasi-mode. Remember what that is? When you have to press and hold, for example, the shift button, and when you release it, it comes back to its default state. So imagine that you have this widget here that has a quasi-mode feature. You pull it out, you rotate it, and then when you release it, it goes back. So you don't have to actually push it. You just release it. And in that case, you get rid of this last bit. And if you do 9.49 divided by 10.49, what's that? That will be something better than 82.7. Uh, why, why we have a that we uh, high Okay, wait a second. Uh, 90? 90.6. And your question, what if you don't have to pull it out, you just rotate it? Wind it? To wind means... Yeah, let's say it uses a battery as a source of power, and it uses this little widget for setting the time. In that case, we don't have that. And we have this divided by the same thing, so, so that makes it one. And we, we, we get to this case. Yeah, but the reason I didn't bring this up originally is because I'm not sure about this part. 
Because as you make this rotation, it's not a discrete digital thing you can you know, count like counting clicks. It's a mechanical action which operates not on a discrete space but on a continuous space. So I'm not really sure how to quantify that. But according to the author of the site, you quantify it as purely transferring exactly as much info as needed to set it to the right state. This part is arguable and requires more thought. Maybe some of you are intrigued by this and you can go read, understand it better than I did and share your thoughts next time we meet. So today we, we encountered two things that don't seem to be realistic. In this case, an efficiency above one and in this case, an efficiency of exactly one. Hmm. Uh, I would have to think about it and see where we've made flaws in our calculations, if there were any flaws. And if we haven't made any flaws, then we have to think about quantifying uh, mechanical actions that you know, operate in a continuous sense. So uh, having said that, we could finish this class. But if you have any questions, let's try and discuss them. Well, I guess that's a no.